Hello, everyone, and welcome to the recorded online presentation of the educational session Analog Front Ends for Large Scale Neural Recording. I'm Professor Ross Walker, and I wanted to give you a brief introduction since we're not seeing each other face to face today. Uh, I'm an associate professor at University of Utah, and I've been there about six years after taking my PhD from Stanford University, where I worked with Boris Merman, who many of you probably know from the data conversion field. My work focuses on interface circuits and systems for neural applications, and uh, I've been doing that kind of work for 10 or 15 years now, and it includes both integrated circuit design and instrumentation designed for laboratory measurements, and also hands-on experimentation with electrode technologies and performing what are pretty similar to neuroscience experiments, but looking at a more mechanistic understanding of what's going on physically in those types of systems. The main goal of this presentation is to bring you all up to an understanding of the state of the art approaches that people are pursuing for large-scale neural recording. And part of that, uh, obviously, is motivating the application itself and conveying a bit of information about the specific requirements for that application. And then doing a brief survey of historical approaches for signal conditioning and for analog to digital conversion in neural recording applications. Here's the outline of the presentation. I'll begin with some background and motivation on neural recording in general, and that will involve looking at electrode array technologies, and some older ones as well as some newer ones that are just coming out of both research and industrial activities. And then I'll culminate the initial part of the presentation with a discussion of specifications and requirements for analog front ends for neural recording. We'll then take a survey through the historic approaches for amplification, filtering, and digitization of neural signals from implanted electrodes. And these will really be the core techniques that the new approaches build on to some degree, um, although these new approaches are fundamentally different and uh, hopefully this presentation will get across to you that there's a great diversity now in approaches for doing neural recording analog front ends. So let's begin with the background and motivation. The most concrete motivation today for large-scale neural recording is understanding the human brain. There's also a lot of interest in futuristic technologies like brain-computer interfaces and neurally controlled prosthetic devices for medical applications. And there are also many successful examples of neural interface technologies uh, in practice today in the medical field, uh, such as deep brain simulation, cochlear implants, and retinal prosthetics. But the key driver for recording neural activity at a large scale is really understanding how information is processed in the brain. And the human brain is one of the last frontiers of knowledge. The scale and complexity boggles the mind, even for technologists who are used to thinking about billions of transistors on a chip. The human brain contains roughly 100 billion neuron cells that are processing and communicating information with each other in a vast network. It is very difficult to pick apart the feed-forward and feedback flows of information in the brain. Feedback is rampant, and the brain is not organized in the same way that we think about uh, electrical engineering technologies, where we use abstraction to be able to build larger, more complicated systems out of basic building blocks. So understanding the human brain has been a goal for quite some time, and people have been using implanted electrode arrays to map out information processing in the brain and produce pictures, like what I'm showing you on this slide. But our understanding is still very, very rough. Uh, 
Um, sometimes we like to think about the analogy of trying to understand a microprocessor by taking 100 oscilloscope probes and inserting them randomly into the circuit and looking at the signals that you get and then trying to interpret what's going on. And that is really about where we are with understanding the human brain at a very low level. Now beyond implanted electrode array technologies, we also use imaging approaches like MRI uh, to do experiments with human subjects who are behaving and interacting with environments and with other humans. And that's what's given us a lot of information about the big picture of information processing in the brain and these large macroscopic regions in the brain. Here's a picture of neurons in the human brain. And this is taken from the cortex. It's a slice of brain that's then been stained to show the neuronal cells. And you're seeing a couple of different cell types these large pyramidal cells here are what we typically record from with electrode technologies. They just give us the biggest signals and they tend to be what show up well on implanted electrodes. And then there's some smaller neurons up here. These are interneurons, another type of neuron. And actually there are thousands of different types of neurons in the human brain, maybe roughly 10,000. We're still mapping them all out. But these are some of the most important ones. And a common feature of neuronal cells is that they communicate information through action potentials. And the processing of information is also largely dependent on the formation of action potentials in a given cell. And this cartoon picture up in the upper right is showing an action potential and the idea that this voltage deflection travels down the cell it's initiated in the cell body on the left, and then it travels down the axon and then hits a synapse where and there's an electrical to chemical conversion process and neurotransmitters are released and then contact the next cell, uh, which will either excite or inhibit the generation of action potentials in that receiving cell. These action potentials our brief transient events, they're about one to two milliseconds in duration. If we were to just look at one point on the axon, then that wave would go by in about one to two milliseconds. The voltage deflection is between the inside and the outside of the cell membrane. The membrane is made up of lipids, which are basically like insulating molecules. And so there's a voltage deflection that travels down the cell membrane and there's positive feedback that uh, uh, keeps that wave traveling. And it's about 100 millivolts voltage difference between inside and outside the cell when this happens. Now the signals that we record with implanted electrodes are much smaller than that. So when you insert an electrode close to, but not inside of a neuron cell like this, you'll pick up action potential signals on the electrode, but they're much lower in amplitude versus the action potentials I showed on the previous slide. And here I show a real recording, and this is one that I made during my PhD work from a monkey subject. And it has fairly large amplitude action potentials, these brief tick-like events in the waveform. And here I'm zooming in on one, and we cherry-picked this, this one because it's so nice looking. But you see it's only 150 microvolts in amplitude. And the maximum amplitude that you'll typically get on extracellular electrodes, where they're outside of the cell body itself, is maybe 1 to 2 millivolts peak to peak. And often they're much smaller than that. Uh, we're often interested in recording action potentials down to the 10 microvolt peak to peak amplitude range. And we'd like to go even lower than that, but around that level, they start to become buried in the background noise, which is composed of thermal noise from the electrode and also the interface with the tissue. And then also uh, noise that's really low level action potentials from other nearby cells. And then also noise that is biological uh, that you might think about as, as a signal, depending on your philosophy.
um, but the overall extracellular voltage potential is caused by a summation of many cellular processes that add up in the vicinity of the electrode. And so beyond action potentials, you also get these slow wavy oscillations uh, like you see here, which we tend to call the local field potential. And there's information also in those wave-like deflections. And so we're interested in recording those also. But roughly, we split brain signals into these two categories, thinking about action potentials or thinking about local field potentials. And I'll show you analog front-end circuit designs that are optimized for one or the other. When you're recording action potentials, you're interested in the bandwidth uh, from 500 hertz to 5 kilohertz. You'll typically design the upper cutoff a little bit higher than 5 kilohertz to avoid amplitude and phase distortion. And the minimum frequency that you're interested in there is about 500 hertz or so. When you're interested in recording the, the lower frequency local field potential signals, well, there you might want to have a lower cutoff that's 1 hertz or even below 1 hertz, and an upper cutoff that's around 500 hertz. Over time, we've gotten better at recording from neurons, and this plot is showing the scaling in the number of individual neuron cells that we're able to record from and distinguish individually based on action potential acquisition. And you see this growth over time. There's a log Y scale here. And actually, there's an exponential growth in the number of neurons that we can reliably record from over time. And this has really been driven by microfabrication and using CMOS techniques to process uh, silicon and other materials to make multi-channel electrode arrays. In the early days, before that, we were starting out with just individual electrodes, which we would put into the body and get them quite close to a cell where we could get large amplitude action potentials. Uh, but then with the advent of CMOS technology, people very quickly um, started making multi-channel electrode arrays where you have a number of electrode sites just on one physical device. And that really opens you up to be able to record from a, a larger number of neurons, and it's driven this exponential growth over time. <clears throat> and I should also point out that going forward, there are also imaging techniques that are very exciting, uh, higher resolution than MRI techniques, uh, but calcium indicator imaging techniques, optogenetic imaging techniques that let you see essentially cellular level activity from a very large number of cells. We're not going to discuss these technologies in this presentation. We're really focused on analog front ends for recording neural activity from multi-channel electrode array structures uh, like these. And so I'm going to show you some examples of state-of-the-art microelectrodes uh, to help motivate really the category of circuits uh, that we're going to discuss in the later part of the talk. So where we are right now is at the right point, uh, given this projection, the straight line projection, which predicts doubling in the number of neurons that we can record from every seven to eight years or so. And these were produced by very state-of-the-art arrays. And I'll show you those electrode structures and also talk some about the circuits that were used uh, for those. That blue X on the projection plot was produced with this device over here on the right. And it consists of a state-of-the-art microelectrode array with about a thousand electrodes down this shank, which is implanted into the brain. And on the left, I show an updated version of that device from the same group. And you see this one has four of those needle-like shanks. So in this approach, they start with a CMOS chip itself, a relatively large one and create the amplifiers and filters and data converters here in the space area and define the electrode sites using photolithography. And then the chip is post-processed to shape those needle-like shanks using MEMS processing and further metallization is, is done on the electrodes. So this is a very powerful approach for neural recording. 
and it's also um, actually one of the oldest ones for microelectrode arrays, and it stems from work done in Michigan uh, to adapt CMOS processing to make multi-channel electrode arrays. So sometimes we call these Michigan arrays or Michigan style arrays. And it's great in terms of getting the recording channels very close to the electrode sites, which gives you good signal quality and also makes the device very compact. All the interconnect between the electrodes and the recording channels is just standard CMOS wiring, so it's very small. But here in the base area, uh, you see there's actually only a few hundred recording channels. Both of these versions of the device um, had that just 384 recording channels. This one had 5,000 electrodes down these shanks, but actually you can only record from a small fraction of those simultaneously. And that's really due to area limitations in the space area. Um, we're just not able to integrate 5,000 channels of recording circuitry into a device of this size. And we certainly like to be able to do that, uh, but it will require, will require more circuit innovation uh, particularly in reducing the area utilization of the recording electronics. And so down here you see a zoom in of those needle-like shanks with sharp tips to penetrate the tissue and electrode sights patterned up and down the shanks. And this is the kind of thing that we want from a microelectrode array, a whole lot of electrodes uh, that are small, uh, something close to the scale of neurons in the brain and with many, many sites to help maximize the probability of getting good neural recordings from a large number of cells. Uh, but right now the acquisition circuitry is, is really a bottleneck uh, for doing these types of arrays. So this one on the right, uh, they actually used two copies of this overall system uh, in one subject and one experiment to record from about 700 individual neurons. And you see, apart from the microelectrode array and the recording channels, uh, there's all this interconnect and back-end electronics that you need to get the signals out. And those back-end electronics are on what we call a head stage, and this is mechanically mounted to the head of the subject for stability. And then power and data connections come in here. So there's really a size mismatch between what we're interested in implanting into the brain and then all the supporting circuitry that's required to actually access those electrode sites. So what we'd like to do is shrink the size of the circuitry, but without sacrificing too much performance in other areas, uh, particularly in terms of noise and power dissipation. Another high-level approach for making microelectrode structures is to use processing techniques and materials that are not actually CMOS compatible. And this is great in terms of flexibility because it lets you really optimize the design of the electrodes themselves and the electrode array structure uh, without being stuck with the constraints of classic CMOS processing. But the disadvantage to this technique is that then you need to somehow interconnect all of those electrode sites to the electronics. And that's a lot harder than it sounds. Probably to you all, you can appreciate uh, the, the difficulty um, in that. I'll start with this one on the right. This is from one of Elon Musk's companies. Uh, he's got a brain implant company now called Neuralink. And they developed this prototype device. Uh, kind of scaling up uh, a really interesting and innovative electrode array technology and then connecting it to their custom CMOS neural recording chips, uh, which you see here in, inside of this um, titanium type package that then gets closed up and put inside the body. And here on the left, this is the classic Utah electrode array structure and it's been uh, going on for a long, long time. It's still used. It's perhaps the most uh, important microelectrode array structure for non-human primate neuroscience research. And it's been commercialized and it's sold out of a startup company here in Salt Lake City, Utah called BlackRock Microsystems. Uh, the channel count is much lower on this one. It's been scaled up to, oh, maybe about 150 electrode sites at the most but the interconnect limitations are quite difficult for this type of technology. And here you see a bunch of wires 
bonded to the backside of this Utah electrode array structure and then bundled up together, typically encased in silicone, and then connected out through another head stage eventually to the recording electronics, which sit on top of a pedestal like this. Okay, so hopefully that discussion of state-of-the-art microelectrode arrays motivates that analog front ends are really critical components of those systems. And there's a great mismatch in the size and the scale and density of the analog front ends versus the electrode sites and what we would like to implant inside the body. So now we can discuss more concretely area and power budgets for analog front ends for these applications. A typical number for multi-channel neural recording chips is about 0.04 millimeter square per channel, which corresponds to a 200 micron by 200 micron area for each recording channel. And the fair way to assess that is to take the overall size of a system like this one, which includes the signal conditioning electronics, the data conversion, and also supporting circuitry for bias generation, clocking, etc and take this total chip area and divide by the number of recording channels to produce a number like this. In research, we have produced systems that achieve even an order of magnitude lower area utilization uh, than that. And I'll show you examples of the analog front ends that were used uh, to achieve this. And this corresponds to about a 70 micron by 70 micron area for each recording channel, which is quite small. You can buy commercial neural recording chips, and the most popular company is Intan Technologies. They're just about the only company, and they offer 64 channel recording chips that are actually quite larger than this 0.04 millimeter square per channel. And so for these researchers to hit 1,024 simultaneous recording channels, they took a stack up of two 64 channel recording chips on each printed circuit board and put together 10 of those printed circuit boards into a head stage device that allowed them to perform the neuroscience experiments. And obviously this type of system is far too large to be implanted inside the body. And it also produces some difficulties for running the experiments themselves. Ideally, what we would like is to be able to shrink the circuitry to a size that's commensurate with the electrodes themselves and then make the entire system fully wireless uh, using either wireless uh, power and data or uh, some combination of wireless and battery operation so that we can put the entire device or at least most of the device fully inside the body and allow more complicated experiments and certainly we would need technology like that uh, to ever put these kinds of devices into humans over the long term. So going forward area uh, is the largest goal uh, to shrink the circuitry. It's the biggest driving factor today. Power consumption is also very important though in typical analog front ends for large-scale neural recording dissipate power in the microwatt level range. There are a few key considerations for power dissipation. One is tissue heating. When you burn power on chips like these, it will heat up the tissue that is thermally coupled to the electronics. And for a chip scale fully wireless device, something around the size of the Utah electrode array, that translates to a maximum power density limit of about 80 milliwatts per square centimeter. But for devices like these Michigan-style microelectrode arrays that I was showing you before, uh, you can burn substantially more power because they're larger devices and they're also tethered to the outside world. And you, so you get heat sinking action there. And if you do your homework and run full finite element modeling analysis of the device structure, uh, also including brain tissue properties and blood flow in the brain, then you can show that actually uh, you can burn more like a thousand milliwatt per square centimeter power for these types of systems. So there's a big range out there. And now we can talk more about low-level specifications for the analog front-end circuitry. Uh, 
And you'll see there's a large range of possible specifications here. It depends very much on the type of electrodes that you want to use and also what kind of signal modality you're interested in. And the biggest classification there is between recording action potentials versus recording only local field potentials. Your bandwidth is going to be higher if you need to record action potentials, and then that will require you to invest more power to bring the thermal noise density down in the electronics. Overall, you want to hit total integrated noise numbers that are in this 1 to 10 microvolt RMS range, 10 being on the high side but still usable, uh, one being on the very low side. Uh, one is a typical number for local field potential recording, but you don't see hardly any designs doing action potential recording with such a low noise because you'll have to invest more power dissipation in the electronics to bring the PSD of the noise down when your bandwidth is larger for action potential recording. But overall, the bandwidths for neural recording are quite low compared to other applications of electronics and so there's a lot of room to use circuit techniques and uh, hopefully take advantage of the speed of CMOS to shrink the area and I'll show you some examples of that in delta sigma converters and also rapidly multiplexed neural recording. So beyond noise and power dissipation other requirements include input offset handling Electrodes have DC offset voltages that are caused by differences in the half cell potentials between the recording electrodes and whatever you use for a reference electrode, which is like the ground inside the body. And so there's a large range of DC offsets for electrodes. It depends on the size of the electrodes, the choice of the reference electrode versus the recording electrode. And unfortunately, data is somewhat sparse out there in the literature in terms of actual numbers for input offsets from electrodes. But these are fairly reliable, uh, just uh, from doing a lot of these experiments and working with a lot of electrodes. Plus minus 15 millivolts is a typical range for input offset handling. It's quite desirable, though, to allow larger, like plus minus 50 millivolts, or even larger than this. The common mode rejection ratio and the linearity are also very application dependent. For common mode rejection ratio, it depends quite a bit on the choice of electrodes and the reference electrode. You may not have much common mode interference in a given application, depending on those choices. But for other choices, you may need a high common mode rejection ratio. And for linearity, this tends to come down to interband mixing. And so if you want to acquire both action potentials and local field potentials, then you'll need higher linearity so that you don't get essentially noise in one band from the signal that's going on in the other. And you may also have large stimulation artifacts. We're interested in driving electrical currents through the electrodes to stimulate neural activity also. And in those types of systems where you have both stimulation and recording, Stimulation causes artifacts that are much larger than the neural signals of interest, and there you will want higher linearity so that you still get high quality acquisition of the neural data itself. But as far as the neural data goes, the linearity, linearity requirements are not so strict uh, because the shape of the waveforms is very much dependent on the placement of the electrodes. There's a lot of randomness there and so there, there's not a gold standard signal that you're exactly looking for. For analog to digital converter specifications, well this depends on the signal conditioning quite a bit and a good way to look at this is in terms of the full-scale range of the analog to digital converter. If you have a high gain signal conditioning front end in front of the analog to digital converter and you can achieve something like a one volt full scale range at the input to the ADC, then you only need about eight bits of resolution. Typically we'll design higher, nine bits, 10 bits, somewhere around that range. But in the newer approaches that are pushing the data conversion closer to the electrodes, the full scale range is typically much more limited and that requires higher resolution in the analog to digital conversion. Another key requirement is input impedance, and this depends on the impedance of the electrodes, 
And the impedance that you see in the overall bioelectrical chemical system when you implant the electrodes into the tissue. One consideration is signal attenuation and parasitic filtering that can come from mismatches if the input impedance of your circuit is comparable or even lower than the electrode impedance at the signal frequencies, then that creates a problem. So we need high input impedance. Uh, certainly in the mega ohm range, giga ohm is highly desirable, although it's difficult to achieve this at the signal bandwidths. But getting giga ohm DC input impedance uh, is usually achievable and is quite desirable to minimize leakage currents from the electrodes and possible corrosion effects that those can have on uh, the electrode material. And finally, when you do have stimulation artifacts or other artifacts, say for movement of the subject, then you need a combination of a large full-scale range and or fast recovery after the artifact goes away so that you can pick up neural recordings directly after the artifact event. Now we'll switch gears and start talking about circuit implementations for analog front ends for these applications. And we'll start with a brief survey of the historical approaches that people have used. And these were largely focused on signal conditioning, but we'll make our way to the data converter at the end of those chains. And we'll build up a number of ideas and trade-offs throughout this section that will then provide the insight that we need to understand the newer solutions, uh, which are moving the data converter closer to the electrodes in order to improve performance. Around the early 2000s, people started making fully integrated multi-channel neural recording chips. And they did pretty much the most simple thing that you can think of. They took an operational transconductance amplifier and wrapped it in capacitive feedback to implement a precise closed loop gain, followed by some band limiting and post amplification before an analog to digital converter. So this approach solves a number of problems in neural recording. You get very high input impedance since you just see a capacitor at the input. The DC input impedance is huge. And the input impedance at the signal frequencies and the action potential band is typically tens of mega ohms as long as your capacitors aren't too big. It's also very easy to remove the DC offsets from the electrodes at the input. And that's typically done with these MOSFET pseudo-resistor structures, and there's many topologies for these. And they're essentially just zero-bias off-state devices to implement a very large small signal resistance in the giga-ohm range so that you can create high-pass filtering uh, at a very low frequency, around the 1 hertz range, to reject the DC offset from the electrodes while still passing the local field potential signals. The post-filtering is typically done through a combination of GMC filtering with structures like these, and then also utilizing the upper cutoff of the front end amplifier itself. Uh, but that leads to large capacitor sizes, and it also introduces variability in the filter transfer function. And overall, the main problem with this architecture in terms of scalability is the large capacitor sizes. Uh, it's very difficult or impossible to integrate a thousand neural recording channels uh, using this architecture on one chip. The approach does give you a little bit of a benefit in terms of transient recovery. So if you have a large artifact at the input from stimulation or from movement, uh, then when you get a large signal at the output of this amplifier, it will turn on the pseudo-resistor uh, path and the resistance will drop, and that speeds up the time constants. And so you get a little bit of a speed up in terms of overload recovery, uh, but the price for that is nonlinearity. When these devices uh, turn on and change resistance, well, they're essentially nonlinear resistors. And so certainly when you have large artifacts, uh, you'll see significant effects from nonlinearity. And even when you don't have artifacts, uh, you can get some significant linearity degradation from having those nonlinear resistors in there.
These circuits have been covered extensively. There's over 2,000 publications uh, related to their design and many tutorials in the past, so I'm not going to go into the details of the design uh, in great depth. But I will discuss the design trade-offs at a high level. The design is largely driven by reducing noise and also achieving a certain total integrated noise at the minimum amount of power dissipation. There are two main noise sources to consider. We need to take into account the flicker noise of MOSFET devices because the signal bandwidths are so low. The flicker noise matters, but it can be addressed effectively through device sizing when you're recording action potentials. For local field potentials, that's typically not enough. You need to use chopper techniques to strongly remove the flicker noise, but you can get away without that when you're recording spikes, which are higher frequency. And you can achieve kilohertz level flicker noise corners using gate areas for the input differential pair that are in this range, hundreds of square micron, and that leads to pretty good overall efficiency in terms of noise and power dissipation. There's a trade-off in balancing the flicker noise versus the thermal noise in the design, and this can be seen through looking at the noise gain of a capacitive feedback amplifier configuration, which is equal to 1 over the feedback factor. And it can be written as 1 plus the closed-loop gain plus the input capacitance of your amplifier divided by the feedback capacitance. And so as you increase the device size to reduce the flicker noise, the overall noise gain goes up, and so you pay a thermal noise penalty, and hence there's an optimum, and that's what leads to the gate areas that people end up with with a well-optimized design. Assessing efficiency comes down to achieving a certain total integrated noise specification with a certain amount of power dissipation, and so we use these metrics down here, the noise efficiency factor and the power efficiency factor, to essentially form a ratio of the total integrated input referred noise of your design compared to what should be achievable ideally if all the bias current for your design were invested into a single transistor. And the power efficiency metric extends that idea to also include supply voltage where the noise efficiency factor only looks at bias current. This power efficiency factor takes your VDD into account and shows the benefit of using a low supply voltage versus a higher supply voltage. People have also investigated open loop structures for the front end amplifiers that connect to the electrodes. And here I show three examples from research. The designs on the left here and on the right, you use AC coupling capacitors to connect to the electrodes, and that has some safety and re reliability benefits, but it requires the use of large-valued capacitors for a very similar trade-off as what I showed on the, the last side um, in terms of the noise gain, because to look at the input referred noise now, you need to input refer through the AC coupling capacitor, which makes a capacitive divider with the input cap of the amplifier. But nevertheless, you can still achieve a little bit lower area and power consumption using AC coupled open loop architectures for the front, uh, front end amplifier compared to a feedback design. And you don't need as much gain out of the amplifiers, and that lets you optimize for other metrics like noise and signal swing a good bit better. You can achieve substantially lower area by DC coupling to the electrodes. No AC coupling capacitors here. And this design used mixed signal feedback to create a high pass corner and also to eliminate DC offset from the electrodes. And that's very beneficial in terms of reducing area from not having large capacitors in the design and going with a more digital type approach. With all these open loop structures, the sensitivity of the passband gain is somewhat of an issue. It's certainly less well controlled compared to a feedback architecture. Uh, 
Luckily, the application is not very demanding in terms of precise closed-loop gain, and it comes down a little bit more to the designer's philosophy of whether you're uh, willing to accept some variation there or whether you demand to have something more reliable that you can count on. And then I'll point out one more complexity with these open-loop structures is that the input bias network is very important. The way that you bias up the input nodes to the amplifier uh, can get you into trouble, uh, particularly if you have a lot of gate leakage into your MOSFETs, then you can get bias point shifts at those input nodes and you can create DC offsets. And all of that is manageable with a careful design, uh, but it is something to be aware of uh, when you make this kind of choice. Chopper modulation is an important technique for removing flicker noise from analog front end designs for these applications. And when you're recording low frequency local field potentials, it is essentially required in order to reduce the flicker noise down to low enough levels to get high quality recordings and to also achieve a good power efficiency in the design. Most commonly, people use chopper modulation on the input side of what would otherwise be AC coupling capacitors. And that modulates the input signal as well as the DC offset up to higher frequencies. So they pass through the amplifier without being corrupted by flicker noise. But the modulated DC offset signal presents a problem in terms of eating up dynamic range in the amplifier because it's much larger than the neural signal of interest. So typically people use feedback uh, configurations like this, which are chopped, and create a very low frequency high pass filter to separate the modulated DC offset signal from the modulated neural signal of interest so that they can reject that large modulated DC offset and preserve dynamic range in the design. Those feedback loops typically use large capacitors to achieve the large time constants that are required for sub 1 hertz filtering. This design used an interesting pulsed resistor technique instead of MOSFET pseudo resistors to implement large resistance. Here a moderately sized resistor was used and then was duty cycled with a very low duty cycle uh, to implement a very large effective resistance to help decrease the capacitor sizes and reduce the chip area. One issue with chopping at the input like this is that you reduce the input impedance of the overall front end and you get a switched capacitor input impedance of 1 over the chopping frequency times the value of that capacitor and that input impedance is typically lower than what you would like this design just accepted mega ohm level input impedance, whereas this design on the right uh, uses a positive feedback circuit to boost the input impedance, and this has become a popular technique uh, in these types of chopper amplifiers. And it injects a small amount of signal current to compensate for the signal current that would otherwise be drawn through the switched capacitor at the input of the amplifier. So overall, chopping brings up problems in terms of circuit area and also complexity of the circuit, um, but it's certainly required for low frequency neural signal recording. Most spike band recording circuits do not use chopper modulation, although there are some examples of good ones uh, that do use some level of chopping. And finally, I'll discuss back-end analog-to-digital converters for the classical approaches to neural signal recording. Uh, the most popular architecture uh, is the successive approximation register, ADC, the SAR ADC, especially with very small CDAC capacitances, implementing the unit caps in the CDAC of the SAR with femtofarad level capacitors, typically custom metal oxide metal capacitors, which reduces the overall area of the CDAC. It also reduces power consumption in the data converter design. And SAR ADCs achieve the best power efficiency and pretty good area too compared to other architectures.
for the design space of neural recording. And they're plenty fast, and people typically use multiplexing. This system on the right shows column parallel ADC conversion for all the signal conditioning channels in each column. It's starting to look a little bit like a CMOS image sensor, uh, which I think is great. And those types of SAR ADCs run in the hundreds of kilosample per second range with multiplexing factors uh, oh, between 8 and 16x typically, which lets you reduce the area utilization for the, all the ADCs quite effectively. And in these older architectures, the data converter was already uh, presenting much less area and power dissipation compared to the signal conditioning. And so, honestly, there wasn't a whole lot of work to do in terms of innovating the data converter designs. Uh, but you see in this system the very large area of the signal conditioning itself. And that has motivated the new wave of innovation, which tends to combine the analog to digital conversion with the signal conditioning into just one or a few stages so that you can effectively uh, shrink the size of the signal conditioning itself by looking at the problem more fundamentally as a data conversion problem versus a classic signal conditioning followed by an ADC type of architecture. And I'll point out that there is some very interesting newer work with VCO-based ADCs and also VCO-based amplifiers. Uh, ADCs and amplifiers that are sometimes doing time to digital conversion and there's a great area benefit for doing that, particularly in advanced process nodes and moving uh, the architecture to be a, a bit more digital uh, versus analog. And we won't have time to go into VCO-based ADCs and amplifiers in this discussion, although I did include a couple references on them in the list of references in the end, and I'll point those out to you. Recently, there's also been some very good work applying Delta Sigma techniques for back-end ADCs for these applications. And this design used the chopper amplifier, which I showed you before, in a low-gain configuration, followed by a high-resolution Delta Sigma ADC. And here, they were dealing with simultaneous stimulation and recording, where they had large artifacts, both in the differential mode and common mode, coming from the stimulation. This common mode interference is rejected by the front end amplifier itself, but they chose to let the differential mode artifact pass through that amplifier with a low gain. And then they designed a very high resolution and highly linear analog to digital converter, uh, and then rejected that differential mode artifact digitally using DSP. The Delta Sigma ADC is over here on the right, and it uses chopping because the gain of that front end amplifier is low, so they had to reduce the flicker noise from the data converter itself and is chopped all the way through. They use a closed loop gain stage before the integrators to improve the noise and power performance of the overall design. And the integrators use these duty cycled resistors, which I discussed previously to implement time constants without requiring large capacitors, thereby reducing chip area and also power dissipation. The design uses a very high resolution quantizer implemented with a 6-bit asynchronous SAR ADC. And that's followed by this data weighted averaging block, which linearizes uh, the CDAC. And uh, the CDAC here in the feedback path is also six bits and applies the feedback signal to this front front end amplifier here. So they used an interesting reference buffer assistance technique to avoid large static power dissipation in the reference buffer itself. They also used some really interesting time varying uh, source of generation in this front amplifier here to improve linearity and hit their 15 bit E knob and a dead banding technique uh, to remove uh, small switching artifacts that would degrade linearity otherwise.
So this Delta Sigma achieved very good performance, and in fact, at the time it was published, I believed it had the best FOM of all Delta Sigma converters at high resolution and low bandwidth, not just for the neural recording applications. And I think it's a great example of using more sophisticated data converter techniques to improve performance and relying less on strong signal conditioning before the data converter. In fact, this data converter is almost good enough to connect directly to the electrodes. The noise is a, a bit too high for most applications, but it's getting pretty close. And I think this really sets the stage for combining the data converter directly with the front-end signal conditioning and doing direct ADC conversion of the neural signals. All right, now we're ready to discuss some of the newest and most exciting solutions for large-scale neural recording. And I'll talk about delta sigma conversion directly at the electrodes, as well as rapidly multiplex neural recording. And both of these techniques can be viewed as discrete time interfaces. And fundamentally, I see them as looking at the problem more as a data conversion uh, problem fundamentally versus being constrained to a continuous time signal conditioning followed by ADC kind of architecture. The first one that I'll discuss is this delta delta sigma direct conversion analog front end. And in this design, the electrodes hook up here to a set of sampling switches and sampling capacitors. There's also a correlated double sampling capacitor here to remove flicker noise and offset from the amplifier, which forms the integrator in this first order delta sigma loop, which uses a single bit quantizer and a 8 bit resolution current mode DAC. Here they had this current mode DAC uh, laying around in the system, but they were performing both stimulation and recording. And when they're not stimulating, the DAC is available. Uh, and so they just reused it in the recording front end. The circuit has a double delta kind of sampling operation. So here in the final one phase, the recording electrode is sampled against the previously converted sample of the reference electrode voltage. And this is provided from another copy of the overall circuit and it's hooked up to the reference electrode. Then in the Phi 2 phase, the previously converted sample of the recording electrode is sampled uh, with respect to the current value of the reference electrode. And the correlated double sampling capacitor is sampled onto here in the Phi 1 phase and applied in the Phi 2 phase to remove the offset and flicker noise from the amplifier. So that double delta operation uh, has a great benefit for input offset handling. It provides essentially passive rejection of the DC offset between the recording and reference electrode. That DC offset does not change quickly. And here they're using a high oversampling ratio. So from one sample to the next, there is essentially zero change in that DC offset. And so they're able to reject it and achieve rail-to-rail -rail input offset handling without much overhead. that double delta operation, it actually causes the output bitstream to represent the derivative of the input signal. So they use a free running counter here to integrate that bitstream and provide representation of the input signal itself. They also use this resettable counter here to create a bitstream uh, that represents the derivative of the input signal. And this can be viewed as a quadrature channel, so they get a quadrature and in phase channel uh, for the bit streams, and they use that for signal processing in the overall system. They're doing DSP on those channels uh, to detect seizure activity. One drawback to the design is that there's this tight coupling between the input impedance, the noise, the area uh, via the size of the CS capacitor and the oversampling ratio and clock power overhead associated with that oversampling ratio. They want to shrink the size of the CS caps, uh, which is good for input impedance, uh, 
and it's also good for getting low area. And so they use a large oversampling ratio, uh, but that actually decreases the input in impedance. It's a switch cap input impedance that's 1 over Fs times the Cs. And so when Fs is large, the input impedance is reduced. They also need this high oversampling ratio uh, for noise considerations. It just goes along with shrinking the size of the CS caps. You get a lot of KT on C noise when you're sampling these very low level input signals with small value capacitors. And so they use a very large oversampling ratio to spread out that KT over C noise as well as the KT over C noise and the thermal noise penalty associated with a correlated double sampling capacitor. So overall, the design achieves quite low area, but a major limitation is that it only performs local field potential recording. It does not do action potential uh, acquisition. And this is uh, due mostly to this coupling between the input impedance and the noise and the size of the cap and the clocking overhead and the oversampling ratio. And all of that might be tractable for action potential recording, but I haven't seen the design from this group or or others that take this approach for action potential recording. And so that's a major limitation when we're thinking about large scale neural recording, uh, which is mostly about action potentials. This next direct delta sigma front end gets rid of KT on C noise altogether. There's no set of sampling capacitors at the input. These input capacitors are chopped and feed directly into this open loop GMC boxcar integrator, which actually forms the second integrator in this second order delta sigma loop, which uses a single bit quantizer. The second integrator is digital here and implements a variable range to the quantization. And this is done to extend the full scale range and to allow the front end to respond well to large transients that you get from artifacts from stimulation or movement artifacts. And so if a large artifact comes and saturates the front end or threatens to, then it, the, there's digital configuration to actually adjust the quantization step size and expand the full scale range, but then it automatically drops the full scale range back down when the input signal is small, so it achieves uh, good noise performance overall. And you see the very high resolution feedback DAC here that's, um, that's required for feeding the converted result back directly to the input for differencing with the analog input. The chomping removes the flicker noise from this front end amplifier and overall the design achieves a very impressive noise and power efficiency. It has an NEF of about 1.8. The lowest reported NEF for circuits of this type is, is around 1. There are designs that do slightly less than one by stacking amplification stages on top of each other in the same bias branch. But this is one of the lowest noise efficiency factors uh, out there, and uh, that's, that's quite good. They were able to achieve that partially uh, because their oversampling ratio is not nearly as high as that last design here. They were able to do this with just a 32x oversampling. Uh, because of the lack of KT over C noise. There, there is no KT over C sampling noise in this design at all. They get some inherent anti-aliasing uh, from the continuous time delta sigma approach in this boxcar sampling integrator. And I'll talk a little bit more about boxcar sampling when we get into rapidly multiplexed acquisition. The design achieves pretty good area, but there's not a huge benefit there, about 0 0.025 millimeter square per channel. They still have significant uh, capacitance here for these chopped input capacitors, and they have uh, a very high resolution DAC and a lot of digital circuitry here 
This is done in 65 nanometer, uh, yet the area is still somewhat substantial. And then, once again, a fundamental drawback to this circuit is that it does not perform spike recording. It was designed for 500 hertz bandwidth for recording local field potentials. And so, once again, that's a limitation in terms of large-scale neural recording, like the last design. But both of these designs are still very important in terms of innovative circuit techniques. And the next design that we'll look at does apply direct delta sigma conversion for spike recording, uh, but unfortunately sacrifices a lot of the uh, performance of these two designs. And here is that one. This is very minimal design, which achieves the lowest reported area for a fully integrated multi-channel microelectrode array device. Here, they were doing the Michigan-style electrode array fabrication, where they make the electrodes on the CMOS chip itself, and then post-process the chip to shape it and uh, metallize the electrodes. And they had a very small amount of area available for the recording circuitry. They wanted to fit a full recording channel underneath each electrode on the structure. And because of the goals of the overall device, uh, which were to have a very deep insertion depth and a very small cross-section. They were limited to 70 micron by 70 micron of area for the recording circuitry. And so they use a first-order incremental delta sigma converter, and it's, it's quite minimal. They use a large oversampling ratio and boxcar integration, uh, once again. And here, the large oversampling ratio helps them reduce the size of this capacitor so that they can meet the area requirement. They have an adjustable full-scale range, and it's really just three modes of operation that you can choose from. The maximum full-scale range is somewhat limited. Uh, I believe it's plus minus 40 millivolts or so. The smallest full-scale range that they designed for uh, is plus minus 11 millivolts, and so that's quite small. It's not a general purpose design that could work with large artifacts from simulation or movement. It can have problems with input offset handling. Um, here the designers had full control over the electrodes themselves and did a good job of characterizing the input offsets from their electrodes, and so it was okay for them to use such a small full-scale range without any kind of input offset handling considerations. They just fully digitize it. And they went for an 11-bit nominal resolution, but they relaxed the linearity requirements and really only achieved 8-bit linearity, uh, which is acceptable uh, for neural recording. And I actually like, like to see that in this design, um, leveraging the opportunity to use a pretty nonlinear data converter to improve performance in terms of power and area. So drawbacks to this design, well, beyond the input offset handling, uh, the noise is pretty poor. Even at the smallest full-scale range, they get 13 microvolts RMS in the action potential band. And this looks even worse at the larger full-scale ranges. It goes up to about 20 microvolts RMS total integrated noise. And at that level of noise, they lose substantial neural activity. Uh, but it was a sacrifice that they had to make in order to meet the area of requirement. And they also sacrificed power dissipation as a result of that. By using such a large oversampling ratio, there's a lot of clocking overhead and pretty much equal power between the clocking, clock distribution, uh, as is in the data converter itself and the power per channel is about 40 microwatts, and that combined with the noise performance uh, leads to a, a very poor noise efficiency factor, uh, which they did not report. And I, I haven't calculated it myself, but it is a very large number. Um, there used to be more focus on noise efficiency factor uh, maybe a decade or so ago, uh, but luckily the community has come around to the understanding that there are other things that matter too, like area utilization, and so this design was well received in the community.
The last technique that we'll discuss today is rapidly multiplexed neural recording. And this is a relatively simple and intuitive idea to take a traditional multi-channel analog front-end architecture like this one and push the multiplexing all the way to the electrodes before any amplification or buffering. Then use a higher bandwidth signal conditioning path and a high sample rate analog to digital converter to acquire all the multiplexed electrodes using a single signal chain. The technique is compelling in terms of the potential for area reduction, but it brings about challenges related to the electrodes. And here I show an illustration of the multiplexed signal that arrives at the input of this amplifier. And you can see it's dominated by modulated DC offsets from the electrodes. Each electrode has a different DC offset. And those DC offsets can be plus or minus 50 millivolts for typical electrodes. And that's much larger than the neural signals of interest. So digitizing those DC offsets as well as the neural signals would require a significant number of extra bits in the analog to digital converter. Uh, which would increase the power and area. So those DC offsets should be removed from the signal path one way or another before digitization in order to preserve useful dynamic range. Another issue is aliasing of high frequency noise because here we're using a higher bandwidth signal conditioning path. Uh, because we need good transient settling for the multiplex signal. So you will fold back high frequency noise from the electronics and also from the electrodes and the interface with the tissue. So big picture, the performance of this technique depends more strongly on electrode characteristics than the traditional approaches where you can limit the bandwidth and deal with DC offsets using simple continuous time filters. But that challenge must be addressed to leverage the huge potential for area reduction using this technique. So we've been pursuing this approach in my research group and we recently published the first experimental demonstration of rapidly multiplexed action potential recording and we showed high quality action potentials from 10 multiplexed electrodes using a CMOS prototype uh, that I will show. Leading up to our CMOS circuit design, we performed extensive characterizations of electrodes to assess their noise behavior. And we did a number of experiments with electrodes in saline solution just in a beaker on the bench in the lab. And here I show a plot of the same electrodes after implantation, where you see changes in the impedance and the noise both go up after implantation. And that has to do with impedance of the overall bioelectrical system formed by the electrodes in the tissue. We were very interested in the high frequency noise characteristics of the electrodes and we showed experimentally that for typical electrodes the high frequency noise matches what you would expect based on fundamental thermodynamics, that is the high frequency noise is thermally dominated and it follows the power spectral density of 4kT times the real part of the overall impedance seen between the terminals of the reference and recording electrodes. We also characterized the biological activity and neural signals and we showed, uh, like other groups have, that at low frequencies the, the biological activity follows 1 over f power laws with different exponents and different frequency ranges and that the spectral components that you get from action potentials uh, decay past about 7.5 kilohertz. So they would show up around here in, uh, in this plot but in these experiments, we were using anesthesia that suppresses action potential activity in order to expose the background noise more clearly. 
We use those noise characterizations to come up with specifications for a prototype rapidly multiplex recording circuit. In particular, the high frequency noise from the electrodes and tissue sets a limit on the number of multiplexed electrodes. And here in this plot, we show a projection based on our noise characterizations of the total noise coming from the electrodes and tissue as a function of num the number of multiplexed electrodes. And so this red line is when you use conventional instantaneous voltage sampling of the waveform. And once you get past seven or eight electrodes or so, the noise penalty from the electrodes and tissue starts to become prohibitive and will impact the overall efficiency of the conversion significantly. So we chose to use windowed integrator sampling, also called charge sampling and boxcar sampling. And that technique reduces noise. You get a rectangular impulse response in the time domain, leading to a sync characteristic in frequency, which reduces high frequency noise. So this ADC driver is a transconductance cell that drives current onto the input capacitance of a 9-bit SAR ADC and that performs the windowed integrator sampling. And so that windowed integration characteristic in the frequency domain filters out high frequency noise from this amplifier, and it also filters out high frequency noise from the electrodes and tissue. So using that technique, you can achieve higher multiplexing factors while keeping the noise penalty from the electrodes and tissue at a reasonable level. So we designed this prototype to multiplex 32 electrodes at the input. And we use a closed loop capacitive feedback pre-amplifier, a pretty simple amplifier, to give a gain of 10 volt per volt before the ADC driver and the ADC uh, in order to reduce their input referred noise contributions. The architecture performs Nyquist rate digitization of each electrode. The ADC runs faster than that just by a factor equal to the number of multiplexed electrodes. To remove the modulated DC offsets, we use mixed signal feedback with digital to analog converters in both the preamplifier and the ADC driver. So each time the multiplexer switches, we switch into new DC offset correction code to both of those amplifiers. That allowed us to use a 9-bit asynchronous SAR ADC architecture for the data converter, uh, which was quite efficient and low area. So overall, uh, this architecture achieves very low area utilization around the same levels as the incremental Delta Sigma architecture uh, that I showed previously. Here I show a range. If you multiplex 20 electrodes, which is reasonable given the thermal noise penalty that you get from aliasing, then the area per channel is about 0.004 millimeter square, which is quite small. We experimentally verified the architecture using just 10 multiplex electrodes and that corresponds to 0 0.008 millimeter square per channel. But this is still an impressive area utilization, particularly in the 180 nanometer process node. Interestingly, the power per channel is about the same as a traditional architecture. When you increase the bandwidth of this amplifier, you need to decrease its power spectral density of noise. Um, in order to get the same total integrated noise as you would have with a conventional architecture. But that trade-off is essentially one-to-one -one in terms of power dissipation. So this approach can be seen as taking all the power that you would have invested in the traditional multi-channel analog front-end architecture and packing it into one higher power and higher bandwidth amplifier. So at a multiplexing factor of 20, the, the architecture dissipates 7 microwatts per channel, equivalent power dissipation per channel. And with a multiplexing factor of 10, you get about 14 microwatts per channel. And these are quite reasonable power numbers. They correspond to a noise efficiency factor of about 5. And this is not the lowest uh, out there, uh, but it's quite reasonable.
So overall, this technique is very effective at reducing area, um, but the dependence on electrode characteristics makes the design process more complicated, and it limits the utility for making general purpose neural recording front ends that can work with any electrode. But for large scale neural recording, particularly in these fully integrated systems with thousands of channels uh, that I showed in this presentation, this technique is, is quite compelling. You will still need to use multiple copies of the circuit, uh, but the reductions in area per channel are quite uh, impressive. And now I'll thank you for your attention and for attending this educational session, and I'll provide a conclusion. So since the early 2000s, people have been very interested and active in designing multi-channel integrated circuits for neural recording. But in the early days, people focused on fairly conventional approaches to the signal conditioning and data conversion, and those approaches were sufficient for the range of channel counts that people were interested in at the time. And looking back on it, when I started in this field, we were interested in 100 channel recording chips and there's almost this philosophy of who would ever need more than 100 channels. The community was very active and produced literally thousands of publications on solutions for those uh, ranges of channel count. But those older architectures, they don't scale up to meet uh, the goals of today. Now we're interested in thousands of electrodes, tens of thousands of electrodes, and there are even forward-thinking projects looking at millions of electrodes. So we need new solutions to support that scaling. And we looked at some of the emerging state-of-the-art solutions, such as direct delta sigma conversion, which uses more sophisticated ADC techniques to improve performance and add functionality. We also looked at rapidly multiplexed neural recording, which has great potential for reducing area, but depends more strongly on electrode characteristics. Another interesting area that we did not have time to discuss is VCO-based amplifiers and ADCs, and there has been significant work in this area, and I provide a couple of the references for you. An interesting area that we looked at solutions for is dealing with large stimulation artifacts, and also dealing with DC offsets. Uh, that are either DC coupled or perhaps modulated, say through rapid multiplexing. And so this is a relatively new area as well, uh, but it's very important. And it's not the main focus of the talk, uh, but hopefully you got a taste of that. And then big picture, we expect this field to continue for quite some time. Right now, we're able to record activity from about 1,000 individual neurons at high resolution, but that's just a tiny fraction of the number of neurons in the human brain. So we're still a long, long ways off from getting the data that we need to understand the brain. And so it's an exciting time uh, now, and we expect circuit innovation to go forward uh, for a long time into the future. And here I provide references, and these correspond to the bracketed citations with years uh, throughout the presentation. The other bracketed citations are just image references and do not appear in this list. Okay, great. So uh, I think this is the uh, end of the talk. So thank uh, Ross very much for your nice talk. Uh, and I think now it's, uh, we're now going to Q&A. So I think there's already one question uh, being posted. Uh, it's uh, by uh, Christophe Antoine from Analog Devices, actually our TPP chair. So uh, the question is, uh, neural recording circuit have been around for quite some time now. So how does Moore's law and finer nodes change the field by open by opening new opportunities. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, this, this is Ross here. Do you, do you hear me okay, Nan? Yeah, I can hear you very well. Okay, very good. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And um, scaling does benefit this class of circuits. Uh, the difficulty with that, uh, the big picture, is that you're starting um, from a pretty high level of performance with the older approaches that used good analog to solve the problems. And they tended to do that at the expense of area utilization. Um, but more digitally heavy approaches, more sophisticated data converters, um, doing more DSP uh, approaches to things like artifact cancellation really rely on good digital. And uh, so designers are now really leveraging that, and to some degree, they're getting forced uh, to do that. And um, finer line technologies are certainly important for doing that. That's all great. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to click for our audiences who uh, have not uh, been in the earlier uh, talks. So if you want to ask a question, uh, please use the bulletin board. So post your question. Uh, by entering through uh, using text, and then I will be able to see it and I'll ask the question for you. Uh, because the system right now, uh, you cannot ask directly by audio, so it has to be asked through the, uh, the Q&A system. Okay, there's one more question coming uh, from uh, Ian Tessu from Silicon Labs. The question is, are the electrodes proximity to the neurons changing the shape of the recorded signal? Mm -hmm. Yep, great question. Um, that, that's true. Uh, the electrodes and not only their proximity to the neuron, but also their orientation relative to the cell body uh, will affect the shape of the action potential that you pick up on the electrode. And you can find computational neuroscience studies and some experimental studies of looking at the extracellular voltage potential at different points um, around the cell body. And, and you can see that clearly. And experimentally, people have done things like advance an electrode very slowly and actually observe an, the, the action potentials as you go by uh, a cell. And so you can see those effects. Um, so there's a lot of randomness with the multi-channel electrode arrays. When you insert the device, um, there's, there's nothing that really defines the proximity or the orientation relative to the neurons that you're going to record from, and and so you're you're kind of uh, stuck there with 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 whatever you get, um, and, and maybe I'll bring up just uh, another interesting thing there with the older electrode technologies. There is a major problem with stability of the neural signals. For many electrodes, the neurons uh, that you're recording from actually change over time due to micro motion and physical changes in the proximity and orientation of the electrode relative to the, to the neurons. Uh, but in some of the, the newer um, uh, microelectrode technologies, especially when you go to a very small diameter uh, kind of wire structure, uh, that, that problem seems, seems to be almost solved uh, with those, which is, which is exciting. So seeing the same neurons over long periods of time, uh, like on the time scale of months, after you do the implantation, but that's a relatively uh, new development. Great, yeah. And while we're waiting for some new questions, okay, oh, there is uh, one, uh, actually a follow-up. Okay, uh, so I guess like uh, Ian just replied that, uh, thank you very much for the great presentation. I uh, like want me to relay uh, this to you, uh, Ross, so thank you very much. Uh, and, and then I think yep. I, I, while we're waiting for maybe some more questions, I, I guess I will ask one question. So you, at the very end, you talk about like your work on this uh, multiplexing, right, multiple channels. So I think that's a great yeah. idea to reduce the area. Uh, but then I'm, I'm curious about its effect in terms of impedance. So uh, do you have like more, so how about impedance of the, the input impedance of the uh, circuit once you do multiplexing, it, will that have an impact? Yeah, uh, great, great question. Um, the technique d does give you something like a switch capacitor input impedance, just like the chopper amplifiers, but it's it's actually not quite that simple. Um, in the switching scheme that we used, we switched directly from one electrode to the next, and that will bucket charge from the previous electrode into the new one, but not vice versa. So it looks almost like a unidirectional uh, resistance kind of effect between those two electrodes. 
uh, but there's no path, uh, direct path to ground there. But uh, if you could imagine briefly uh, discharging that, that input cap in between electrodes as you're doing the multiplexing, well, then you would get a 1 over Fs uh, times that C switch cap resistor to ground from every electrode. And then you're essentially back in the same ballpark as the chopper amplifiers. And mm -hmm. um, so, you know, certainly we're interested in applying input impedance boosting, uh, maybe in some combination with uh, different switching schemes at the electrodes. Uh, but a lot of it comes down to understanding the effects on the signals and on the electrodes themselves. And there just hasn't been that much work done in that area relative to circuit design and circuit innovation. But, uh, but yeah, so we're looking at, at, those, at those questions. The way it is right now, uh, you get tens of mega ohms resistance from one electrode to the next, and uh, that's much larger than like the parasitic resistance in between the electrodes just through tissue paths. Got it. Yeah, thanks much for uh, your answer. Uh, so I think for now there hasn't been other uh, questions being posted. So I think maybe we'll just uh, end our uh, session here. So thank you very much for uh, your uh, talk, excellent talk. And uh, it's uh, really nice that, uh, that we're having you here. Uh, and then also I'd like to also at the end thank all of the audiences for joining in. Uh, I saw like an uh, audience coming from the West Coast, from East Coast from uh, Europe, uh, from Asia. I saw like an uh, uh, like, uh, audience from India, from China, uh, everywhere from the world uh, tuning in. So that's uh, great. Thank you very much for being with us. And then let's, at the end, let's uh, uh, please join me and thank the speaker once again. So thank you very much, Ross. Thank you all, it was my pleasure.